sisters and brethren, we have to create our own word because the only word found is brethren. And I don't think we should there. Good morning. May I begin by apologizing for coming late. I tried my best to balance the time I needed to sleep and therefore came, got a little delayed and you know what that means in terms of traffic in Nairobi. You're five minutes late, it becomes half an hour or one hour. So sorry about that, but I'm really glad to be here. And as uh, Professor Macau said, I actually politically or socially, as a social and engaged citizen, have been raised in civil society. And once you are raised in a certain way, it never really can go out of you. So that even when I was in government, there are those who saw me as too much of an activist. An activist is not a bad word, but in Kenya, it's made to look dirty. An activist is an engaged and active citizen. And that's what civil society is about. Civil society is the representation of that active and engaged citizen. And there are many, including in villages, but they have no forum where their voices can be heard nationwide. So civil society does represent those active citizens because they have forums and they have the space to make their voices heard all over. And when I think of that now, I think my late paternal grandmother was actually an activist. The stories she tells me about herself, about her life, I see her in me, or I see myself as part of her. And that makes me know that we have very, very many active and engaged citizens, and civil society does represent them, and also provide them, or rather affirm them that what they are doing is right. And there is one gentleman I must acknowledge whom we all came to know during the BBI appeals, Aluchiel. That's the strongest representation of an engaged and active citizen, but the only contrast being that he's well-educated and in a position to drive certain points home on his own. The person fighting with bread and butter issues will not be able to do that. So I want to say this for me is a homecoming of sorts. And I want to say I'm glad to work with you. I'm glad that you, my relatives, because I said I was brought up by, in civil society, have uh, called me so that we can have this engagement. And to say how happy I am that there's a prospect of partnership and working together because our country is our responsibility. And I know that my principal, the Right Honorable Raila Amolo Odinga, is very focused on the issues you have raised, issues of transparency, accountability, good governance. Issues of electoral justice has been on it. Issues have been on it too. Issues of uh, governance, we've been on it. Nobody can do it alone. We are human beings. Sometimes our pace slackens, either because of fatigue or many, many issues. We need each other so that we keep on pushing us ourselves to do better. And I would say that throughout my struggles, in and out of government, the civil society has been at my side. And even in the last 10 years, or more, when I've been out of government, I've worked hand in hand in different spaces with civil society. Therefore, my candidature is your candidature because I realize those little or great things we did together are what kept me alive and engaged and therefore capable of being thought of and considered for the position I hold today. So you've been part of my journey and you are part of me. 
and we want to move together. And I will say this of Right Honorable Raila Odinga, the fact of choosing me as his running mate, a woman with a mind of her own, known, uh, focus on certain issues, what the media sometimes calls at Musimamo Kali. <laughs> but I just know that I do take a stand. For him to actually even think of considering me, he's not only a man of courage, conviction, and believe in himself, but he is, he has demonstrated seriousness on the issues that I hold dear, on the shared values. He wouldn't have uh, named me if he was not serious in the things he's saying about good governance, about fight against corruption, about human rights and rule of law. So I do believe that he is serious and I can commit to you on behalf of my principle that we are serious on these issues and we certainly will need you and we will need every Kenyan to work with us. I keep thinking, if we go back to 2003, because the election was 2002, the last two days, 2000, we woke up 2003 to celebrate. And I see the determination in citizens themselves to restore rule of law, democracy and human rights to the extent of ordinary citizens ordering police officers who have ammunition return that note you just received. Citizens repossessing KICC, a mob going into KICC, but an orderly one. Not a table damaged, but taking back what belongs to them because government property is public property. They took back their building handed it over to the minister. They did not assault the people who were working on behalf of Kanu in the building. I don't even think we can call them a mob. I would just say masses recovering what belonged to them because a mob is disorderly. That was not a mob. It was citizens' actions, the best that I have seen so far. So all we need in Kenya to succeed in the things we are talking about both the electoral justice, and I'll tell you how, and governance, is to reawaken the fire in the bellies of our citizens, a critical mass of them. And this we shall do together. I know that it is not about laws. We may need laws to outlaw keeping cases days on end. Just like we have electoral cases going in six months, we may need laws, Speedy Trial Act, which restricts the court to a certain time so that we don't have these adjournments, at the adjournment to let a person continue with the elections. They didn't give us time to figure out how to get on with health services when our money has been looted. They didn't give us time to know how we can have food when there is no money to help citizens when they are in need. So we may need certain little, to tweak certain little things. But what we really need is to reawaken the fire in our bellies to demand accountability and good governance. And we need to spread to the citizens across the country the message that they can come together. And when they come together, those at the center can go to their rescue to help them demand accountability. Our constitution, just in the word public participation in Article 10, we have it all. You can challenge everything and anything for want of public participation. And we are not saying you consult 51 million Kenyans. Offer a platform. And therefore, I want to give first step towards electoral justice. We must write, as Asimio, we should write. Let me use the word should. I must slip into the role of deputy nicely. We should write. No, you have to keep on reminding yourself. We should write to the Electoral Commission, and also civil society should. 
as a consortium, demanding that we be briefed on how they intend to conduct the elections, the tools they intend to employ, and most of all, just one question, how has IBC addressed the shortfalls that made the court nullify a presidential election? Because it looks like it, would, it is totally unwise to go into another election without addressing. If they have addressed, we need a brief. And if they haven't, it may look two months away, but some things, it's not about laws. It's just procedures. We have enough time. So we must demand a brief like yesterday. I was on these issues, and those who we have been on the same forum on electoral justice, these are things I have mentioned, having traveled the whole way. We in Asimio consider this a winnable election, and we do intend to win it, not marginally. We're going to work so hard to increase the gap because there is a threshold that makes an election uncontestable. If you remember 202, that's how, it's not that it was uh, devoid of flaws. There were flaws, but the support by the electorate was so overwhelming that even those attempts to violate could not succeed in subverting the will of the people. We need to build a momentum to get there. Why? Because we may not address all the issues we need to address now. So one way of overrunning all those short failings is explaining to the people why this is the side that we think about them. It doesn't mean that we are infallible. We are human. That's why we need each other. We need engaged citizens. We need civil society to keep on saying you are veering off the road. Go back to the center. That is not our priority. We need those voices. They can be irritating when you are seated there and you are trying to move, but they are necessary. I always recognize that. Even when, as an MP, you are criticized by the electorate, sometimes you may say to yourself, these people, I work so hard for them and them, but it is absolutely <laughs> necessary. I keep on telling myself, this is necessary, however much you don't like it. And I may dismiss you, but when I go to sleep, it comes back and I wake up better in the morning. So whatever names we call you, please, this is not something you can give up on. And any serious government will realize that there is a gap that the government can never fill. The citizens' gap can never be filled by the government. And I want from this podium to speak to our civil servants. Sometimes it is our civil service and the top ones who give the government a bad name. When citizens are asking for explanation, why do you fire like you have been attacked by an enemy? Even when a case is in court, why don't you come with a sense of responsibility that you owe an explanation to your employers? Is it too much to start seeing citizens as your employer who must question you whether the work expected of you is being done the way they want it. We are wasting a lot of government money, paying hefty court fees, lawyer fees, and wasting time when these things could be sorted in a meeting like this. And I have that experience because I was one of the lawyers for Kenya Human Rights Commission on the Huduma Number case, you know? You cannot treat citizens as the enemy when they question. They are entitled to answers. And I, I want to assure you, we will be ready for your questions. We shall not always smile when you ask, but we will answer. <laughs> because sometimes you find it, you're so busy, you find it, un, in quotes, irritant. But it is absolutely necessary. No human being is perfect. The moment you let us, you know, veer off the road, we may go off in a way we will never come back together. So please, whether we smile or not, it is your duty, our duty as citizens, and I've done it. 
So even if I don't smile, please, just keep at it. When I sleep, I will, I will remember my roots. And I'll remember <laughs> that actually the Constitution tells me to do that. Now, let me say the how central governance is to everything. We have agreed that debt is not necessarily bad. But how you manage those farm funds to open up the economy and generate revenue, which you then get from the citizens, is what really matters. Even for us to do things in our own homes, we either borrow from circles. Me, I mention circles because those are the ones that have given me money without much question. Circles, you borrow from banks, you borrow from whoever. But you must have a plan to pay and an intention to pay back. A government is not different from a business. So borrowing and spending must be prudent. Physical discipline is what we are asking for. And yes, we are looking forward to succeeding in what we are doing. And God help us, we will. And we will inherit a bad debt situation. But there's something that can be done about it. I will not try to explain everything, just to say, instilling physical discipline alone already gets you somewhere. Imagine we are losing like 800 billion, you know, outright theft, corruption, abuse of public funds. If we plugged in and stopped that leakage, already we would be having so much. If the debt is 1.3 trillion and you save about 800, you already are going towards somewhere. And we haven't even gone to other areas. We haven't even removed, talked of good governance in the tax regime, where nobody gets spared and nobody gets harassed. We just pay to Caesar what belongs to Caesar. Good governance is the answer, is the antidote to our problems. In fact, where Clinton is said to have said it's the economy is stupid, I'll say it's governance stupid. That's what it is, and that's what civil society stands for. Now, in elections, what did I mean that um, the citizens, an overwhelming win can overrun all issues, but also personal responsibility. Why are we talking about governance? It's not just those in government. I am again talking to our professionals, to civil servants. This is your country. Don't be at war with your country. When you do things the way they are not supposed to be done, you are at war with your country. As an electoral officer, when you help manipulate the electoral process and abuse it, you are at war with your own country. I actually personally did try to sue four individuals, three um, electoral officials out of the last elections and one party official. The court did not give leave, but I have appealed. I will think about the appeal further on. <laughs> I have no personal war with any of those individuals, but the message is that we can come for you as an individual. Don't tell us electoral commission. Institutions are made up of you and me. Until we take personal responsibility, until we are made to pay individually, we will not make a country, we will not strengthen institutions. And I remember during the last election of the United States, where it was reported and we had it because this is the information age, we could hear the recordings, where Trump called and the Secretary of State in Georgia, a Republican state and probably his supporter, asking for 11,000 votes to be found. And the guy just answers him, Mr. President, I got a job to do, you see? Meaning he will do it according to the Constitution, according to the law. He knows how costly, individually, it will be if he does it in and else. That's just a lesson to us. A country is made by you and me. You working for electoral commission or hoping to be a clerk, a presiding officer, a returning officer. You, police officer, 
or any other law enforcement officer, you civil servant, you principal secretary or CS, it's you personally. It's not that ministry you're working for, it's not that institution, it's you personally we must get. And that's the message. We are now appealing this electoral season, all those who are going to be engaged in the elections, kindly, kindly, love your country enough to do the right thing. Love yourself and your country because if you brew chaos, they will also come to you. We need a healthy country and God has granted us a most beautiful country, a resilient country, a resilient people. We just need to take this, run with it, and make a beautiful country for ourselves. I realize I will not be able to say all the things I intended to say, but that sums it up. I welcome you with open arms, and I'll take this to my principal, and with Macau here, we will take it to the entire Azimio. We would love and we look forward to working with you to make, to strengthen our nation, our institutions, not just to win the elections, thereafter to win the war of ending poverty, ignorance, and disease. And I want you to know one of the things that attracted me to Asimio even before I joined is the prospect of deepening the implementation of Article 43 on social and economic rights. The thought of social support to the citizens who are at the bottom of the ladder, the thought of improving our hospital and having an insurance that covers everybody in the name of Baba Care, the thought of supporting children to go to school, the thought of support to single mother households, which may end up being the majority. That is those who are in, in need, because not everybody is in need. All those things, our manifesto focuses on economic social rights. We are promising Kenyans economic liberation. I can see you are talking about it. So your two themes, electoral justice, economic justice, are core in Azimio. Welcome home, just like you have welcomed me home. Asante ni sana.